Hello and welcome to today's episode in which I have a go at making a delightfully meaty vegan Salisbury steak. I was in my YouTube studio the other day having a look at the analytics page. Uh, it's kind of the back end of a YouTube channel, so you get lots of metrics and lots of data that you can start adjusting things to. And it lists viewers by countries, so it kind of ranks them by volume. I've been on the lookout for recipe ideas, and while I was in the analytics section, I thought, I wonder if it'd be possible to find the national dish from each of these countries and try and veganize it and have that as a video series. I made a list of the top 10 countries while I was at work and then I've been doing some research to find all of the national dishes. The only problem with this idea, so I did the list three, four weeks ago and then when I was in analytics again last week, everything's changed. <laughs> so it's probably gonna have to be something that I take a little bit of artistic license with. <laughs> Um, or maybe it's just going to end up being the top 40 countries, who knows. We're going to start with the United States, that's where the biggest proportion of my viewers are. When I did a Google search for American National Dish, uh, it popped up with hamburgers, hot dogs and Salisbury steak. Hot dogs, I mean, they're fine, it's just not something I particularly want to spend ages making. <laughs> burgers, I've already done a couple of burgers now, but Salisbury steak sounded quite interesting. Basically, it's a hamburger in gravy, typically served with mash. So I thought, well, <laughs> I mean, it's kind of a two for one then, isn't it? Because I've got Salisbury steak and I'll be making a burger to serve the dish with. I've no idea how true this is, but apparently a true Salisbury steak is made with sirloin mince, uh, whereas a hamburger steak is just kind of any meat. It's gonna be a fairly simple recipe. It's just a case of assembling some ingredients and then cooking them down. I found a recipe for vegan Salisbury steak on rabbit and wolves. So I'm gonna kind of base mine on theirs. Uh, I'll link to that in the description for you. Whenever I've done kind of meaty things in the past, I used pui lentils and their recipe uses lentils. So I thought, oh, it's gonna be a good opportunity to get that in because I know how it's gonna respond. Uh, pui lentils have got quite a, a deep umami flavor in and of themselves. They've also got a texture that lends itself quite well as a meat replacement kind of thing. I started thinking about textures then, because I was like, yeah, but lentils are you know, they're fairly samey as a texture. So I'm gonna adapt it slightly by adding some quinoa, which has got, when it kind of replicates the texture of minced beef and also some buckwheat. When I was writing out the ingredients that I need, I was like, I'm gonna double it, because then I've got loads for the freezer. <laughs> um, I've done way too much, <laughs> like way, way too much. But I think what I'll do, is mix everything together and then pull out enough to fry off so I can, you know, do the tasting and everything with you. And then I'll do the rest of the mixture, shaping it all and freezing it off camera because then I can put a podcast on and just take it easy <laughs> rather than trying to, because this is gonna be, yeah, I'm gonna have meals for days, weeks, months maybe. What I think I'm also gonna have to do is split the mixture across two bowls because yeah, it's gonna go everywhere otherwise. Quick note on the lentils as well. I'm 99.5% certain that pui lentils are the same thing as these lentil there. I think what it is, is pui lentils are the same things, but they're grown specifically in the pui region of France. And it has an appellation control, uh, you know, like champagne, can only be called champagne if it's grown in the champagne region of France. I'm pretty sure that's what's happening here. These are much cheaper than pui lentils. Uh, when I'm in the edit, I'll stick a little note on the screen so you can see the price comparison. If you'd like to follow along with the series and discover the world via your belly, like this video and subscribe to the channel. If you tap the bell icon, you'll be alerted as soon as the new one's published. So I'm gonna take roughly half the quantity of lentils. And then before I add anything else, I'm going to mash these down a bit with a potato masher. According to the original recipe, you can use any kind of lentils in this. So use up whatever you've got in the cupboard, or if you use the red lentils, they cook much faster, so it will save you a bit of time. And you can also use the red lentils to make the chicken liver pate that I did, and also it makes a really nice, easy uh, kind of tofu type thing. I'll add half of the quinoa into each. Half of the buckwheat. I'm just gonna combine these together a little bit. And in case I didn't mention it, I just think the buckwheat I put in there, because it's got like a nice kind of bouncy, soft texture, which I think would be really nice in there with the, the quinoa, the lentils. 
I'm also going to use Vital Wheat Gluten to bind everything together. I think what I might actually do is put some of my dry flavourings in here at this stage because it is going to be really difficult to mix this properly once I start putting the gluten in because that's going to start binding everything quite tight. I'm going to use some beef flavour plant-based stock powder. I use the Massel brand. Two tablespoons into each. We'll do a quarter teaspoon of salt into each. I don't tend to use lots of salt though, so feel free to increase that amount. Really good amount of black pepper. Probably half a teaspoon in each. Last minute addition, I'm gonna use some of this mushroom powder that I made. This is dried shiitake mushrooms that I put in the coffee grinder just to make a fine powder. It's got like a nice umami flavor to it. I'll do a teaspoon in each bowl. I'm gonna do a teaspoon of beetroot powder into each, partly to get the color nice and dark brown, but also it's got a nice deep earthy flavor. And then I'm gonna use some of this 100% cacao. Cacao is what they use to make chocolate, but this hasn't got any sugar or anything in it. It's just 100% bean that's been processed. Yeah, like half a teaspoon in each. And this has just got like a nice savory, deep flavor to it. Feel free to skip these extra flavoring bits and just rely on the beef stock, that's absolutely fine. And then work that into it. Quick note on the grains, you want them to not be hot <laughs> and ideally not even warm. It'll be harder to work it with your hands, but also it will start cooking the vital wheat gluten, which means you might not be able to mix it in as well as you need to. I'm gonna add a cup of panko into each. These are like Japanese breadcrumbs. They're very light and crispy. Feel free to use regular breadcrumbs as well. If you haven't got breadcrumbs, you can use things like cornflakes, crushed rice cakes, that kind of thing. I'm just gonna mix this in as well. Then I'll add the gluten. I did think about using oats, like toast off some oats. That's another option for you. If you want, feel free to put some herbs or spices, that kind of thing into the mixture. But I'm gonna keep it fairly basic and just beef flavored because I'm gonna make a gravy to go with this. And that's when I'll start using herbs. I'm gonna add a cup of vital wheat gluten into each. It's about 120 grams. Start mixing those together. This obviously isn't gonna be one for gluten-free people. So what I might do in the future is make a gluten-free version. So we're using the vital wheat gluten to act as a binder, even at this stage without any extra liquid. It holds together really well, and that's gonna help A, hold things together, and B, once the gluten starts developing, it becomes very tight in structure. Gluten's the stuff in bread that gives bread its structure. I mean, it's great for meat substitutes. So now it's time to mix up the wet ingredients. So I'm gonna do a cup of hot water, which is about 240 mils. This is water that boiled, just to make it easier to whip the other stuff into it. Do a good squeeze of tomato puree. I don't know, a couple of tablespoons. Gonna add a half cup of light soy sauce. That's about 120 mils. I'm gonna add a teaspoon of liquid smoke, just to get a nice kind of smoky, barbecue-y kind of flavor going on in there. I'm gonna do a tablespoon of Henderson's relish. This is like a vegan Worcester sauce. Worcestershire sauce has got anchovies in it, so that's not vegan. Give that a mix. So I'm gonna pour half into each bowl. I think I'll just do one bowl at a time though. I've done 100 mils to start with. Um, I just don't want it too wet. The smell's coming up already. Very, very meaty and delicious. Very savory and umami. Mm. Yeah, it might actually not need the remaining. So there's another 200 mils left. And I had 400 of liquid altogether. Um, well, let's start going in manually and kind of kneading it. This will help that gluten develop a bit. So I'm just pulling a chunk out just to get an idea of how it's holding. Because I'm probably going to do pieces about like that. Because you don't want them too thick because the inside won't get a great texture. This will be quite kind of soft. Yeah, I think that's going to be perfect. I've shaped our four little patties, ready to be cooked. And then these are the two bowls. That's how much I've got left to <laughs> patify. I'm gonna put a little bit of olive oil onto these. Uh, just rub it in with my fingers. The original recipe says for baking these, put them in an oven preheated at 425, which is gonna be around 210, something like that, for half an hour. Um, that does seem awfully high and awfully long. <laughs> 
and I'm going to do mine in the air fryer. These are plants, you know, it's not going to cook the same way that meat does. It's going to get very crunchy on the outside. And then I'm going to put them in the gravy sauce, so soften back up, but that's only going to work to a degree. I'd rather them need a longer and still be okay than charcoal. I've decided on 165 for 25 minutes because that should give me enough time to get the gravy done. The eagle eye amongst you will have noticed I've got the instant pot on the counter here. Uh, I'm going to do some cheesy mashed potatoes <laughs> to go with the steaks. So I just chopped down a two kilo bag of potatoes, chuck them in the instant pot. You just want enough water to cover the bottom and I've got them on for 22 minutes on high um, and that's plenty of time to cook the potatoes. So that usually takes takes like eight minutes to come up to pressure and then cooking time is 22 minutes. Once it's finished, it can just stay in there until I'm ready to finish them off. I'm gonna warm up about a tablespoon of oil in the pan. So this is gonna be for the mushroom gravy. Apparently the mushroom gravy is quite a common traditional accompaniment for a Salisbury steak. I looked at the ingredients, thought, yeah, that sounds quite nice, but I'm gonna add a couple of extra bits in there just because. I'm gonna slice up a white onion and then I'm also gonna add a bit of ale, like dark ale to it, because I think that's gonna really lift the flavor up to the next level. I'm gonna take the tail off, split down the middle, and then peel off the outer layer or two. Just feel it, it'll tell you where, where it wants to come off. Feel free to skip the onions if you don't want them in there, but. I think onions, mushroom and ale are a really delicious pairing. And I'm gonna slice, I'm trying to figure out, yeah, like just under a centimeter, that kind of size. Once the oil comes up to temperature, I'll drop the onions in. And then I'm just gonna sweat those down so they get a bit of color on there. This is a 300 gram pack of mushrooms. It's 75 grams more than I need. The original recipe says eight ounces. So I'm gonna just give them a bit of a wipe on a paper towel. I'll save that many for another day. Do the mushrooms any way you like, but I'm gonna try and get nice kind of slices because then it looks nice in the thumbnail. These are chestnut mushrooms. I'm not sure what those are called in the States, maybe criminy. I'm going to use some fresh thyme in the gravy at the end, so I'm just going to pull that off the stalk. The onions are all golden, so I'm just going to pull those out onto a separate plate. Put another tablespoon of oil into the pan, and I'll tumble the mushrooms in. You can do it together in the same pan, but I just didn't want to overcrowd it and then wreck the slices. So cook those for about five minutes or so until they go nice and golden. And then I've got five fresh sage leaves. So I'm gonna make a little stack. So they're all stacked on one another. Fold it in half and then just blast the knife through. I want quite a fine shred on that. Like that, and I'll put that in over time. I've got three little garlic cloves. I'm just gonna peel those. I'm gonna do the garlic in this little grater. Uh, this is one of the ones I got from Timu. I just like the way it grates garlic. Get nice little shreds and we can head back to the mushroom pan. So you want a nice bit of golden color on them. The steaks are finished, so I've just flipped them over and put them on for another 10 minutes, again at 165. So I'm gonna pop that garlic in, let that fry for maybe two to three minutes. I've had my stove on six this whole time. Uh, it goes up to nine. So it's a kind of medium high. You can go higher if you want. It just means you've got to pay more attention to make sure things don't burn, especially once the garlic's in. I've still got the remainder of that liquid that I didn't end up using in the burgers. So I'm going to use that to make the gravy. I'll add the mushrooms to the onion plate just to get them out of the way for a second. I'm going to use this Bishop's Finger Dark Ale. I'm going to pour it into the pan um, and this is going to help burn a lot of the alcohol off. If I wasn't using a non-stick pan, there'd be bits of onion and mushrooms stuck to the pan. So adding the liquid in like this, it's called deglazing. So it helps lift all of that flavor off the bottom. So we'll pour this into the remaining other liquid. Do I want a bit more? Yeah, I might do a bit more actually. I'm just gonna dry the pan very roughly because now I'm gonna add in some butter in a second. I'm just topping the remainder of the liquid up to 480 because we need two cups of stock altogether. 
I'm adding hopefully three tablespoons of vegan butter into the pan, let that melt. Because we're gonna make a roux to thicken the gravy. I don't actually know if I've made one before. Because what we're gonna do is add flour. If you try and add flour straight into a liquid, a hot liquid, the gelling process kicks in straight away. The function of a roux is to coat each grain, you know, each fluffy bit of flour in fat. And then that helps you work it into the liquid without the gelling process kicking in so quickly. So I'm switching to a non-stick safe whisk. And then I'm gonna sprinkle over three tablespoons of flour. Work that in. So I'm hoping this is gonna form a paste. I just looked up a general rule, whether vegan butter responds differently. We'll find out in a second. I think this is working okay. So I'm gonna cook this out for another minute, maybe. Just wanna get a little bit of color on the roux. I'm gonna take it to a blonde. Just to get a little bit of toasty flavor on there. We really wanna cook off the flavor of the flour, otherwise it'll be raw and not very pleasant. Now, back to the whisk. I'm gonna slowly start adding the liquid in. So I'm gonna try and get it as smooth as possible. So that's all of the liquid in now. So I'll add in my herbs. Oh yeah, <laughs> this looks great. <sighs> That's a bit of a workout. Maybe do it in a smaller pan as well. It'd be slightly less work for you. Okay, so that's all cooked off nicely. So I'm gonna drop the temperature back to a five. I've not put any salt or anything in here because remember that liquid had soy sauce in it, but do feel free to just use two cups of the stock and then start adjusting the seasonings. Add the mushrooms and onions back in. Well, this is going to be proper stick to your ribs grub. <coughs> so I'm just going to nestle the steaks in. I'm just going to scoop some of the mixture over the top because now I just want to soften them a touch because they are I've got a little bit of a crust on from the air fryer. I might slosh a little bit more water in just so it's a touch more liquid. And then I'll put the lid on and let it just might actually bump it down to three. I'll leave that for a few minutes just while I sort the mash. Now how's that for a delicious plate of food? <laughs> Ooh, yes, that's looking divine. So I'm quickly put together the cheesy mash. So it's very sticky and unctuous. And I think that flavor is gonna go amazing with the Salisbury steak. Oh God, it's so humid in the kitchen. <laughs> very wet. Let's have a go. Mmm, -hmm. <laughs> mm. that's amazing. There's lots of really nice savory flavors going on. Nice textures as well. It's perhaps a touch salty. So if I was making it again, I'd probably skip the added salt. I think the soy sauce is enough for me. Mmm, but with the gravy on there, mmm. <laughs> Try some of the mash. <laughs> Rachel. Oh man, <laughs> the cheese, because I use Cathedral City plant-based and some smoked, applewood smoked. And the tanginess from the cheese with the ale and the onions and the mushrooms and the savouriness of the steaks. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> get some cheese in your mash. Try and get the texture inside the fire. Yeah, very meatloaf-like. Mm. The remainder of the mixture that I'm gonna freeze in the patties if I don't plan ahead and defrost them before, well before I need them, to do it from frozen, what I'd do is put it in a pan, maybe do three minutes just to fry on each side, and then pour in either stock or a mixture of beer and stock or wine and stock, that kind of thing, and kind of poach it for 15, 20 minutes, something like that, and then add a thickener. I had initially planned on doing a big batch of the roux and putting it in the freezer, but kind of showing you how to do it. I just didn't have enough time or energy this morning. But you can do that, so just, you want an equal volume of flour and butter. 
uh, and then once it cools down, so you can put it in like an ice cube tray, that kind of thing. If you want to do it in the air fryer, go maybe to do from frozen in the air fryer, maybe go like 155 for 35, 45 minutes. Stick a probe in if you've got one, just to make sure it's above 60 C, and then pop it into your liquid, like into your gravy for a good few minutes, because it's gonna get much more of a crust on the outside. But putting it in the gravy definitely just soften that crust up nicely. <laughs> If the rest of this plan series is going to be that delicious. <laughs> oh boy, am I excited. <laughs> I'll put some ideas and variations, etc., down in the pinned comment. Um, and also how you could maybe do it gluten-free. If the video performs well, I'll perhaps do a gluten-free version. I mean, it's going to be a few months because <laughs> the freezer is just going to be full of Salisbury steak. Not the worst thing in the world, but this video, like all of my videos, <laughs> are brought to you largely due to the financial support that I get from my patrons over on Patreon. Uh, it's also really nice to have a community of people where I can <laughs> write my weekly posts and give them updates of what's going on in my brain and the recipes that I've got planned. <laughs> if you want to join up, I'll stick a link down in the description for you so you can come and be part of our film and TV chat. If you want to make sure that you don't miss any of the videos in this plan series, if you like this video and subscribe to the channel, look for the little bell icon and give that a tap, and that way you'll get pinged as soon as one of the new videos drops. And then while you're waiting for the next part of the series, check out this.